Okay, some other interesting features here uh, near the Perea River in southern Utah, right near the Utah-Arizona border near Highway 89. Um, one interesting thing I'm looking at here, this is all, all these reddish rocks here are part of the uh, Entrada Formation. Um, makes up some of the scenic areas in southern Utah like Goblin Valley State Park. It's also the unit you see uh, forming the arches at Arches National Park. Uh, it looks a little bit different here, but it's the same unit fundamentally. Uh, down below us in the wash, there are some white sandstones that are part of the Carmel Formation. Um, but what we're mainly looking at here is this real interesting uh, feature behind me, this white, somewhat vertical, well, it is vertical, um, feature cutting through the rock layers. Now, a lot of times when we see these things, these are what we call dikes. And most dikes are igneous, meaning that they're intrusions of magma that are cutting through the rock layers through some fracture. And then that magma cools and crystallizes to form uh, that feature there, that dike. In this case, we're looking at a different type of dike because igneous dikes would show uh, crystals all squished together, maybe a granite or another igneous rock type. These dikes don't involve magma at all. These are what we call clastic dikes. And the word clast means uh, sediments. So these are essentially sediment dikes. And if we come up and look at this a little bit more closely, we can see that sure enough, uh, this whitish material is full of little pebbles, uh, little grains of material. It's mostly sand-sized particles, um, but some little pebbles in here as well. It's definitely a different grain size than the adjacent reddish rock here. And we can even see there's a difference in uh, the resistancy as well. This, this material is really hard and resistant, whereas this material is really crumbly. You can just kind of tear it apart with your hands and, and flake it off. This is mainly mud and, and silt-sized particles. Over here, it's just kind of falling apart. Uh, so we can see these things kind of sticking out in relief. I'll try to back up a little bit here so you can get a, a better view of it. Um, and it's not the only one here. There's kind of a, an eroded remnant of one uh, right here. This kind of little knob sticking up right here. Uh, let's see, there's, there's a small one over here sticking out of the rock. Uh, and then it looks like that may be an eroded one there as well. And so the way that these form, these clastic dikes, are pretty cool. Um, they necessitate a certain, type, certain set of conditions. And so you need to have um, a high water table. So this would have occurred sometime after the Entrada Formation was deposited and laid down, uh, kind of in a, uh, a wet environment. And so you need a high water table that saturates the rocks below. You also need to have below these rocks, you need to have uh, some sandy layer. And luckily, again, we have this white uh, Carmel formation, that cross-bedded sandstone down there sitting below the red um, Entrada formation, which is what we're looking at here. So we have saturated sands below. We've got the red muds of the Entrada formation above. The important uh, consideration there is that muds are fairly impermeable. It's hard to get water to move through them because the, the pore sizes are so small. And then what we need is some sort of triggering mechanism. So we've got saturated sand below the mud formation, um, a high water table. And then if you can, you can create some sort of trigger, and, and a good trigger for this might be something like an earthquake. So an earthquake shaking is going to uh, that slurry of water and sand below the mud unit here is going to want to rise. It's actually going to fluidize the material, make it want to rise. And once uh, the, the pressure can exceed the pressure of the muds, it will just basically shoot through the mud layer um, and create at the surface, if you were to be at the surface, you'd see kind of a what's called a sand boil or a sand volcano. We've actually seen these with modern earthquakes. The 1983 Boar Peak earthquake had little, uh, little muddy, or not muddy, sand uh, water explosions uh, locally, just out of these little kind of pits. These are what we call, again, sand boils or sand volcanoes. Um, I also believe uh, one of the recent earthquakes in New Zealand, uh, I think near maybe Christchurch, I can't remember the details, but there was one there as well. There's actually some video footage, I think, showing the, uh, the slurry of uh, sand that came out of the ground. 
Um, but nonetheless, you can get that stuff mobilized. But then when the shaking stops, uh, the water and the sand solidifies and it forms this vertical pipe, this plastic dike cutting up through the rock layers here. I also think this is just me kind of armchair quarterbacking a little bit, but there's also these really interesting kind of squiggly marks. There's some of these lines along these fractures here. I wonder if some of these are just smaller scale features um, cutting through some of this, this mud as well. Um, some of these are really interesting here, though they're more horizontal and kind of a little different shape. So not quite sure about those. Uh, but nonetheless, plastic dikes, kind of a cool feature that you sometimes see. Uh, so don't always assume that these are igneous in nature. They can actually be produced by uh, sedimentary processes as well. And then some sort of triggering event, in this case, possibly an earthquake, maybe a landslide, something that, that shook the ground enough that it mobilized that pressurized slurry of sandy water and injected it into the overlying layers. So just another cool little feature here in the beautiful uh, wilderness here of southern Utah.